I don't drink really vodka. You don't drink in vodka? In the morning. <laughs> Only in the morning. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to get started on uh, day two of our Nels Bohr Lectures in Cultural Psychology, but it's also uh, day it's one. It's also day one of our Visual Methods doctoral course. How many are here from the, the doctoral course as well? Okay. Hello. <laughs> uh, great. So just so I know your faces. So today we're going to focus more on uh, general methodological issues. So for the doctoral course, this is kind of the big picture methodology, and then we'll focus in on the, the visual aspects in the three days to come. Um, for the Nels Bohr lectures, uh, we're sort of moving a little bit away from theory and into more uh, general methodology, the methodologies that are appropriate for cultural psychology, and then we're going to end on more, how, how do we apply cultural psychology to different practices? So without further ado, Jan Vosner. Yeah, thank you. So I want to thank everybody of you for yesterday. The result of your discussions yesterday led me to redo my slides for today. So instead of only 78 slides, I have now 85. <laughs> so if you get tired of it, then you are guilty for doing a very good job yesterday. <laughs> so today I'm going to do slightly different things than yesterday. This is abstract you don't need, but this is what you need. So I'm trying to fill in the gaps that I felt were left after I finished writing that little book, and actually some gaps that I think were left from yesterday. So I'm quite interested in the liminality and also the liminality of the role of a scientist. The scientist is, who is the one who is purposefully putting oneself in a liminal role. The scientist is one who stumbles, doubts, distrusts, or distrusts authorities, while actually becoming authority or expert in exactly the same way. It's a very interesting combination of authoritative and doubtful rules. So this is a quote I very often use from Michael Polanyi, and today I give it a very special feature following your enthusiasm of yesterday. Uh, you will read it in the text anyway, but the important issue is any process of inquiry unguided by intellectual passions would inevitably spread out into a desert of trivialities. And following yesterday, it is clear the desert of trivialities here is far away, and your passion was very nicely demonstrated yesterday. Now we come to a very interesting question. Yesterday we had a very nice panel discussion, which revealed something about what we are seem to be lacking, but so something is quite interesting. We, have, we are lacking a fresh look at collectively created historical myopias. And so yesterday you got the feeling of very strong need to rewrite the history of psychology. But why? Well, you saw yesterday also a very interesting contrast between two realities. One is the reality of sticklebacks in an aquarium. And the other is encounters with the mainstream in psychology. I think they are interesting contrast in the sense that one of them you can study and the other of which you should study, but you are part of it in, the, in exactly that relation. And there's the third point that is quite important, the importance of being earnest and explicit about our failures rather than reiterate successes. Without that, there is no future in our discipline. We may have successes, but we learn from our failures, not successes, because we learn for the future. We do not glorify the past. And one of the interesting issues is that this is a protection against cultural psychologies, I use a plural here, becoming orthodoxes. They are all the, have all the danger of becoming orthodoxes, like most theoretical systems or fashions in psychology have come. And I'm very worried about that after 20 years, 22 years of editing culture and psychology journal, I'm very worried that it sooner or later becomes so fashionable that it becomes another orthodoxy and will become forgotten again without any solution. <coughs> That's a real worry here. Now I would want to discuss the notion of objectivity, which I consider not objective, 
but I consider it a hyper-generalized sign field that actually regulates our researchers' way of thinking. Who determines, who decides what the objective is? Uh, we relating to our objects, that is an old traditional way of looking at objectivity, is a monk's way. The monks would be studying different objects in study, sitting in the monasteries. They will disagree with one another about the object, but they would not disagree about the fact that they spend lifetimes trying to make sense of the object. Um, the disagreement is possible in the sense of, at the same time, of agreement of mutual complementarity. This tells us something about the difference between psychologists and physicists. When psychologists review grant applications, they evaluate them down as much as possible. The opposite, the opponent is the enemy. We will crush the opponent, and this is very easy. When physicists do it, they may disagree with one another, but they will review them up. They want to be sure that the others have also voice in this system of them. So this is quite interesting about the moral underpinnings of psychology as a society. Yeah. Now, who relates to the who, who, who is objects? The epistemic market. Alberto made a very passionate plea yesterday about the relevance of epistemic market. Since he introduced the concept, I have disagreed with him vehemently about it because I think epistemic market is made by somebody. Market doesn't make itself. <coughs> You can see that very clearly when you open specific places where you can trade stocks before the stock market opens at 9.30. You can set the price between 9 and 9.30. The APA, APA sets up the rules of objectivity. We tell that standardized methods are objective. Well, a physicist would laugh at that. Standardized objectives or the standardized methods would be the end of science rather than the beginning of science. So in other sense, a semiotic notion of objectivity is a meta-level sign that somehow regulates our societal activities in all social sciences, not only psychology, of course. So uh, that's what I'm starting to point out, that when I talk, we talk about objectivity, we are actually involved in an act of symbolic purification of what we are doing using very clearly the notion of coming from, first of all, chemistry, we need pure materials, but secondly, from religion, we need to purify our souls. So psychologists, when they talk about objectivity, they are trying to purify their souls in some ways, but of course the souls are as rotten as ever, so it doesn't very much work. The interesting issue that Ted Porter, a historian of statistics, points out is that actually purity and objectivity were be, became watchwords in social sciences, but they could not separate from the moral underpinnings of the, of, the of the society, whereas physical scientists could do that. So they could have their own purity notion, whereas social scientists' purity notion is linked with administrative systems. So we can talk about administrative symbolic purification of science including psychology. So this is all the talk of these are hard data, these are soft data, qualitative methods are like that, quantitative methods are like that. This is all purity talk. It has nothing to do with objectivity. It has only something to do with social group distinctions that are being made. When it comes to objectivity, objectivity needs to be determined somewhere else and not in the dis social discourses of scientists. So, I very much liked Sven's and Lena's invention of the notion of stumbling. I stumbled upon the finding of stumbling and I liked it very much because in a way the stumbling upon phenomena is what makes us fascinated by them and then end, end up studying. But I would even add to it that scientists are people who knowingly stumble towards some phenomena rather than just haphazardly stumble upon them. And they also grip on stouting what seems obvious. Now here we come back to the notion of role of history that was yesterday very nicely brought up. And very concretely, I would say, because the three themes become quite relevant from rewriting of history followed by yesterday's afternoon discussion. First of all, Rohr's effort to get into European Reformation time, 
16th century, which is quite important. In some sense, psychology is a Puritan or Protestant science in the sense of its religious and, and uh, so to say, affordances, let us call them. Secondly, when we look at the 18th century and our efforts today of talking about poetic instance, then we actually will find answers in the 18th century at the time when aesthetics and uh, social understanding of human psyche were not yet separated as they become later. And last but not least, the 19th century story of natural philosophy is very much worth taking up from a very serious point of view. I hate to point out that even five years ago, I spent most of my time in my first lecture not on Niels Bohr, who is a nominal leader of our five years of activities, but actually Hans Christian Ørsted, who was both a relevant figure in history of physics as well as natural philosophy in the Danish context. Since five years ago, I have been looking for people with good knowledge of Danish who would want to work on Hans Christian Ørsted and analyze his role in the actual development of science I have not yet found any. So last but not least, history is not a museum where we put old stuff which nobody uses, but actually history is exactly the place where we will have all kinds of possibilities to look at ideas that at that time failed, but in their failure may have been actually something very relevant for our present 21st century. So that's why the rewriting of constructive rewriting of history we were talking about yesterday is extremely important. I am one of those very strange people who considers contemporary publications to have 200 years more or less span. So everybody else says two years is enough, but I say 200 years is more or less sufficient. And every year I tend to push that back. <laughs> so maybe I reach through our stage and getting back to 16th century but I still have much to develop. So the central action for psychology, which I think we could talk about and think about, not so much talk about, is a notion of talking about open systems. A book I mentioned is very strongly making that point, but I would like to elaborate that a little bit. Open systems have very well-defined characteristics. First of all, they depend on the constant exchange relation with the environment, and this was mentioned yesterday already in different versions. And secondly, most importantly for us psychologists, they axiomatically do not allow that future states can be predicted from the previous organizational forms. Well, that eliminates quite a bit of efforts in psychology to predict the performance in the future from measurements to quote measurements from the past. So basically we throw away much of existing psychological evidence simply on the basis of its axiomatic non-fit with a phenomena. And that is sufficient. And that would purify our science quite well. So there is a major mismatch of what is some considered called scientific method and what psychological phenomena are like. And we need to go back to developmental biology to find some answers to the open questions which we even haven't asked yet. Hans Triesch, in his effort to look at embryonic development, introduces a notion of equipotentiality and equifinality, which basically illustrates the importance of different trajectories in arriving at similar outcome. When yesterday we were talking here about screwdrivers and throwing screwdrivers away, and there was a clear difference of opinion about whether screwdrivers are good to heap, keep or whether they should be kept in, in between different houses so you can run, up, run between houses and ask for screwdriver. I think Trish's answer is very clear. Namely, screwdrivers are not necessary to be keep. They are already there. They are already there in the sense of organism may being capable of variable trajectories to the similar outcome given, given particular blockages of some of the conditions. I think Alex's point about genetic system operating in ways of enormous redundancy is very important. I need to add that almost anything I say about semiotic cultural psychology of my own is direct borrowing from modern protein genetics. You can replace the specific labels 
terms are used, but the basic structure of the notions is very similar. That is a surplus of particular mechanism, parallel, parallel mechanism leading to exactly the same outcome. Regulation of some of the signs by other signs are exact borrowings from regulation of gene by some other gene. So I have not done nothing new, I have just tried to uh, plagiarize genetics in a little way. And not, not uh, genetics of a of behavior kind. So in, together with my Japanese colleagues, I have been fascinated by equifinality points. And sometimes we are asked, why do you need them? Equifinality point, it doesn't mean anything more, but a particular road, a temporary connection point between two trajectories which diverge later to more trajectories. And this is exactly the point. The equifinality point is relevant as a particular anchor point to see the phenomena at the particular, in a particular form. I will come back to it once more today because this is precisely the domain where the method construction becomes extremely relevant. For it becomes very relevant for method construction. Why? Because a method allows you access to particular phenomena. This is an analog of microscope for our psychological system in the sense you look not for collecting data everywhere, but you look for specific moments in the phenomena which allow you access to the particular phenomena. 99% of the reality doesn't allow you this access. 91% somewhere will allow you. You need your theoretical underpinnings to understand where to look. You are not looking everywhere. Yeah. This is another take on the trajectory equinality notion where you would have different trajectories of the past arriving at the equinality point, assuming that they will diverge further in the future. So that's a, the notion of using the equinality point as an anchor point for selection and use of different, uh, uh, different uh, phenomena in method construction is quite crucial. Now, in one of the issues is dynamic system theory, I'm no, sorry, in the uh, open system X perspective is how to deal with seeming ontology, seeming ontology of the present moment, which is basically the moment of stability. And from the point of view of stability, the stability is not what is, but what is being maintained. In other sense, dynamic process that is maintained. This, which you will also see in the text, and is a effort to put together the different versions of qualitative and quantitative transformations of trajectories. Basically, the very seemingly complicated scheme tells you only very one simple thing, namely that the fluctuation in a system can lead to far from equilibrium states, which may lead to breakdown of the system or the reconstitution of a system in a new form. Nothing new. This is basically what you see already from physical chemistry 40 years ago. But we come to some interesting questions from there. What to study under the notion of open systems? Where to study? How to study? And why to study? Well, we start from the why question, maybe, from the last one. We, we focus could be on innovations in human beings introduced in their lives. And this innovation, the way the innovations are introduced, may allow us to understand basic human psychology. Not against the being, but exactly the psychological phenomena at the moment of emergence of innovation. Uh, how to study? Well, we come back to this on the notion of different conditional genetic analysis. Not a new idea again. Kurt Levin in 1927 advocated it very heavily, and nobody listened ever since. So to say, the uh, psychologists keep measuring, measuring something they consider that exists, rather than looking at the conditions under which that something can exist. Yeah. That's a basic contrast here. Now, I would introduce the notion of microgenesis, methogenesis, and macrogenesis. So we'll come back to it. Where to study? You study where the goal-oriented nature of human conduct is observable. Again, the notion of you don't study it everywhere. You study it in some places where you can observe what you want to observe. Sometimes this means slowing down, otherwise very rapid psychological processes. Because most of our psychological processes are hyper rapid. We are ready to deal with phenomena at any moment when we need to. This is, we can talk about adaptability or pre-adaptability of the speed here. 
But of course, this doesn't allow you to exactly dissect how it is happening. A good example of it, from my own system of understanding, the phenomenon of panic attack would be extremely important. But to dissect a panic attack because of its rapid moment is almost impossible. The panic attack is a perfect example of what I call a sign explosion. But at the same time, to see how this explosion actually happens is almost impossible. So, and what to study is, of course, what you study. So this is an example now where I'm trying to locate two versions of cultural psychology in exactly at some multi-level system of microgenesis or actualgenese, mesogenesis, and ontogenesis. I do it persist practically in order to demonstrate that the different systems of cultural psychology can be located very precisely in this system of levels. Not to talk about the general linkage of social representation theory, which is in this quadrant, green, red quadrant up there, and say this is linked very easily with my cultural psychology of semiotic mediation, the green quadrant over there. No, they are linked at different levels of organization of the developmental processes. And, this, and they are more important is they are linked between levels. They are regulating the move between the levels. So microgenetic events, which happens all the time in all moments in your life, are relevant for ontogeny, development of your life course, only and only if they lead to overcome the buffering system against ontogenetic transfer. And most of them do not succeed. The basic principle of regulation is not to let something into ontogeny, rather than to let something into ontogeny. Now, a serious psychoanalyst would probably simply disagree, saying, look, what about trauma? Early trauma outcomes, yeah. Trauma may lead eventually to ontogenetic aspect, but how, with what constru construction? And secondly, what next to trauma? Trauma may be important, but it's a singular aspect that does transfer to ontogeny. Most of our everyday life experiences, all microgenetic, do not. We repress them, we sup suppress them, we forget them. They're irrelevant. Perform a thought experiment for a moment. If each and every aspect of your everyday life were relevant for your life course development equally, the result would be a total co co uh, catastrophe in the ontogenetic development. You will not be able to in any way develop further because everything is important. Today's morning of cup of coffee is as important as my, the fact that my girlfriend left me. So both of them are in a cacophony. This is not the case. You see the specific buffering between the levels, and I'm simply specifying social representation theory in its different uh, functions operates as a buffer between, so to say, activity systems and ontogenetic development. This is also where, for example, school intervention programs necessarily will fail for the simple reason that if they are not given the possibility of transfer to the upper level, they will be local events. They will remain local events. This will have very interesting implications for European democracy projects that Sergio is talking about because this is exactly the question of not what is you can do in intervention, but exactly what blocks possibilities of intervention. The lower level, so my version of cultural psychology of semiotic mediation, you saw yesterday my optimistic notion that hypergeneralized science would ascend to the future, but I'm not specifying how. I'm basically operating at the lower level here. So this is only an indication that you need to very precisely situate the different versions of cultural psychology in the total hierarchical system of a life course organization. Just empty talk about they are linked is not sufficient. So to say, that's, that's basically my puritanistic attitude. Now, among different perspectives in contemporary Social science is borrowed, of course, from physical sciences. 
is a notion of dynamical system, dynamic systems. This is a very interesting notion because it carries from basically meteorology into psychology, first of all, development of psychology, and it involves the notion of future. Almost the only concept of system that I have come across that is not linking past to present, but actually future to present. But how? Well, it, the system posits certain notion of attractors, which are hypothetical processes in the future, towards which a given system is striving. So to say. There is no internal pull for that striving. There is no guidance for arriving at the dynamic, dy dynamic system outcome. It's exactly the future somehow pulls the past uh, or the present. This is interesting because the uh, cultural psychology side, in different versions, emphasizes very strongly that our social world guides the development of our immediate ways of being, our long-term ways of being, and so on. And what we import from meteorology physics is actually that there is no guidance. There is only some mystical pull from the future. So what does it mean? This is how the upper level is an artistic reconstruction of the beautiful power of the attractor. This is so-called the strange attractor. Of course, it is not existing anywhere. It is not a picture of a real attractor because a real attractor is an abstract concept. It is not an image. But as an image, it is possible to create on computer and present to our m minds, which is a very ex ex interesting one. The lower image is a more realistic version. The attractor is based on the attractor basin. In other sense, this attractor here is guarded by or limited by this barrier here. This attractor here is limited by the other one. This is an attractor basin, and inside that attractor basin, different particulars try to arrive at the center, which they never do. In other sense, the power of the dynamic system's perspective here in the attractor notion is that it is uh, oriented towards an objective that is never reached, but is constantly approximated. This is a certain conceptual power and one very specific weakness. The very specific weakness is obviously that this is a basically monadic system which assumes dynamics, but it has basically built on a separated domain. It's a, this is one monad, this is another monad in this system. Okay, so how can we deal with it? Well, maybe we don't. Or maybe we do. Yesterday, Nikita made a very important point, which usually escapes us in psychology. He said something like that brain, neuroscience is not about psyche at all, it's about brain. And I think this is something to emphasize very strongly. We in psychology look, look at neuroscience not as neuroscience, but we look as a competitor. A competitor that actually eats up most of our potential funding and is therefore very dangerous but we have nothing to do against it because the fashion goes for neuroscience. But if you look at neuroscience not as a fetish, but as a system of thought, it has precisely similar intellectual and epistemological problems that we have in psychology and cultural psychology. It deals with complexities. Brain is a very complex system. It deals with the dynamic aspects. Brain is not fixed despite the facts that endless number of MRI pictures that we are shown show us one or another structure of fixation in the brain. It is in reality never fixed. So I decided to bring to you a specific mathematical elaboration of the dynamical systems from 2001 to illustrate the parallels and possibilities of using some of the notions of dynamic systems uh, concepts, but in a modified way. Chuda is a Japanese mathematician who is actually an outsider to system dynamic systems because he thinks more. When you think more, you become an outsider, and this is very productive for you and very dangerous for your careers. So what he does, he instead of looking at the pulling factors of the dynamical systems, of the attractors, he does something more interesting. 
he looks at the decaying aspects of dynamic attractors. He looks at what he calls attractor ruins, attractors that have lost their capacity to pull, and therefore some of the developing process that moves between the attractors is not actually pulled into the attractor, but is actually released by the attractor and goes to some other place. So it literally goes around from one attractor to another attractor to a third one, never finding its place. And this is more realistic to both our psychological systems as they function, also in issues of psychological development, which happens precisely at the moments of relative disequilibration. And last but not least, may allow us to introduce some innovation. This is the innovation I introduced in 2004 in an obscure Japanese publication. The same Tsuda system is enriched by the notion of director, some particular condition that would lead this to the escape or jump from beyond one attractor or repulsor. I don't get to that attractor. In other sense, this system introduces a forward-oriented particular regulation of a movement between the different attractor ruins. Now, this idea has not gone any further, but it could go for the simple reason because it gives you a mapped environmental map of different attractors. Those of you who will be working on visual methods may find this actually quite interesting because you could almost directly map this on a walk through Alborg when the weather gets a little warmer, <laughs> so to say. In reality of our psychological life, we have something like that. When it comes to building a church, which ends up a place for pilgrimage, this is not an attractor, this is human construction. It becomes an attractor only and only under the condition of the meaning system that pushes rather, first of all, the particular person who needs to have a specific dialogue with oneself, talking of self as a dialogue of yesterday, for 30 years of walking towards Santiago de Compostela. Without any doubt, when the pilgrim arrives seeing this cathedral, this, after 30 days of walking, you may feel something or some fantastic feeling about this pilgrimage place. Your particular religious belief system would fortify it. So to say you have reached your goal, even if only a tourist and not a pilgrim, so to say, and you are fascinated by that. But you have not, this is not pulling you there. You are going there for the 30 days walk of yourself. So the attractor is not a sufficient explanation for a particular way of your spending 30 days on Camino. It may be an important aspect, additional aspect to it, but it is not sufficient to tell this causes something. Well, this is even another example. This is a gift of a closing, obviously very special metal closing, that a particular Austrian upper-level aristocrat in year 1628 gave as a present to the mother of the newborn son of uh, his. Obviously another aristocrat. This is a... a Metal costume for the writer, whatever is the, the English term, that approximately matches five-year-old. It's very unlikely that the boy who would become five-year-old would ever be wearing it. It's not meant for the boy, it is meant for the mother. And it's a specific, objective, concrete signal for the future of what the future life course of that boy born to a high-level aristocratic Austrian family in year 1628. The father dies in 1632. The mother is a regent of the whole region. The boy becomes a, takes over later and uses up all the riches of the father so that the economy can develop further and the aristocratic family can become bankrupt. So that is the back story. This is a, but this is an example of this future-oriented guidance of exactly this wandering on the attractor fields. This leads us to an interesting point. Whenever people to try to un unite Gibsonian thinking about affordances with cultural psychology, I am quite surprised. 
because one of the very basic aspects of cultural construction notion and Gibson's direct perception action notion simply do not go together. Gibson developed his notion of particular uh, notion of affordances very specifically in very specific demand context, trying to land airplanes, which is real task, but it is not all of the task. He developed it together with a, a dispute with the constructivist direction of Jerome Bruner and others of the time, and the fight between direct perception action in the 1950s and the constructivist notion of the same kind. This fight basically ended up in such a way that Gibson becomes cultivated later as if he were giving us an answer to personal environment relations, but he does not. The only place where you see any cultural notion of affordance coming in, into the affordance theory, is Harry Heft's notion of post, post box. Post box is something you recognize very easily if you know the country. I, whenever I travel to other countries, I very often find it difficult to make a difference between a post box and a garbage can, <laughs> which because you don't understand the coding. So, Instead, what we have is exactly the Georg Simmel's notion of cultivation, which leads us to a very basic look at something that psychologists like to talk about, which is called variance. Now, in traditional psychology, where analysis of variance, which used to be a tool, because made into theory, you see very interesting moments. You see the theories that are all built of analysis of variance, generalized from that, having necessarily to live with the assumption of summativity of variance. In other sense, all components of variance, including interaction of different kinds, sum up to 100%. This is a demand from the analysis of variance as a method, and it is carried over actually to analysis of variance-based notions of theories. Let me point out that if analysis of variance maxi maximum equals 100%, it is close to any possible development. In other sense, as long as we assume we are dealing with developing systems, and open systems are particularly developing or can be developed, the variance is always over 100%. When I ask the question to my statistical friends, and there are some very good thinkers in statistics, whether it's possible to develop theoretical model of variance, analysis of variance, with a notion that the variance is always over 100%. The usual answer is no. And the second answer is maybe, but we have to rethink with various, various issues. So, in another sense, analysis of variance, you can see, is simply not applicable to phenomena of open systems. What would be? This is a scheme you have seen before, many of you have seen before, but it adds here a little bit of elaboration as of yesterday. So the question of a dynamical system involves a question of maintenance, death, and development. This is an abstract model of an extremely simple system, PQS, which is involved in trans, in trans uh, in, in, in basically notion of cyclicity. You see that the transitive-intransitive contrast that has been around in logic has been quite central here. Transitivity means that if P is dominant over Q and Q is dominant over S, then P is also dominant over S. That's the most notion of the transitivity. Intransitivity is obvious as opposite. And P is dominant over Q, Q is dominant over S, and S is dominant over P. That gives us a cycle. The usual example of this cycle that we re usually refer to is Krebs' uh, bi biological cycle, biochemical cycle. We need to be added that Krebs, Hans Krebs took about eight years in the development of the biochemical cycle to realize that it is a cycle rather than a linear order. In order to take, take some time to understand that the order is non-linear. And of course, the problem then was how to label the cycle because each part of the cycle is equally relevant. You cannot say one is more relevant than another. It gives you an example of dynamic hierarchy, which is not hierarchy at all. 
At, you can look at this system at every moment, in every place. You can enter at PQOS, and you can always recreate the tr transitive system. But the intransitivity guarantees that none of the transitive systems fit. So what I would add here is a question of, first of all, how to be it becomes transitive. This trajectory here turns PQS P system into PQS stop. This transitor system keeps a cycle going, and this one allows for development of new path. And the question, obviously, is what happens here? Well, you can replace that position anywhere in the cycle, because it doesn't matter where it is. I, by, by coincidence, I put it here. The critical issue is how is that location organized? And I claim that it is organized by, first of all, as a rupture. Some of us are happy about ruptures. Secondly, it is a catalyzed rupture by autocatalyst as well as allocatalyst, something from environment, something from oneself. This, con this combination of self-catalyzing and, and other catalyzing system, that opens the door to look at development right here. Before that, we will have no idea of development. So this leads us to, interestingly, to what I, for many years already, talk about as individual socio-ecological frame of reference that links directly the theoretical talk now with method construction. The individual socio-ecological frame of reference requires that you construct your methods in looking at person-environment relations under two sets of guidances. One of them is from oneself, the other of them is from the somewhere outside, somewhere in the environment. So the two are being coordinated in the process of relating to the environment. So we cannot talk about environmental influences only, we can talk about environmental coordination of our own orientation within the environment. What does it mean? From that angle, what would be methodology? Methodology is another 20-year-old, 21-year-old scheme, which we invented many years ago, for two reasons. One reason is that it puts the methods in the subservient role to the total methodology cycle. The other is that it puts the intuition of the researcher into the center of that cycle. The researcher with one's educated, cultivated intuition is the one who stumbles into different phenomena develops particular methods in conjunction with both meta basic assumptions and phenomena and constructed theory. You see that this is nothing more than a very classic scientific model. 150 years ago, this would go without any need to emphasize. In 2017 and the last 20 years, we have been talking about it, and again, nobody listens and we, they don't care because it undermines some of the very sacred objectivity determined by APA, which is the notion of methods, you know, notion of standardized methods, notion of objective methods, notion of quantitative methods, and so on. Yeah? So this, uh, this is a point to, uh, pointing out to you that when we talk about methods, including qualitative methods, quantitative methods, including mixed methods, including visual methods that you will be talking about. All the categorizations of methods are actually only organizational. They have no quality of their own. That is, you can see very easily how a quantitative method becomes qualitative, and I will show that very soon. So how does a metacode emerge? And this is something that I actually came into, stumbled into, to be more exact, when I was writing the text for that you see on the internet on our meeting here. Only after that occasional stumbling into the normal distribution, I started to analyze it more carefully. So it's a, really the, when the previous scheme was about 20 years of age, what you hear now is about two weeks of age. And I asked a question which, in some sense, had bothered me for some time, but I had never really managed to got into it. How did the normal distribution curve become normal in the normative sense? 
that normal distribution is a standard staple aspect of quantitative psychology and all the statistical psychology is taken with, is clear with everybody. Any student who goes through statistics course gets that message bright and clear from the beginning. You honor normal curve. You look everything, you look for normal curve in everything. If it is not normal, you use special methods to transform it into normal. Uh, rather than Poissonian or rather than any other form. Uh, so in other sense, normal curve is our guide in empirical psychology. But as I said before, when we talk about objectivity, there is a moral dimension to objectivity. It is somehow good to be objective. So when we talk about normal curve, it is not just the normal curve of a, that is labeled normal curve. It somehow is normal. The question is how. So, there is, I would claim there is a very specific aspect of making the normal curve into mor morally normal curve, and that is the tension in the original that is divine design. Moral curve in our statistical applications is contemporary equivalent of divine design, which is, has lost in all connections with divinity. It is, but it's basically exactly the same as it was. And there's an interesting historical demonstration of that. First of all, talking about divine designs, the whole period of 1780s to 1820s or 30s is filled with landscape paintings, which are fakes. They're not real landscape paintings. They are painted landscapes as if they were landscapes, and they are landscapes to demonstrate the power of the original design. You see that, uh, you see the geognostic notion since more or less, say, 1770s, 1780s onwards. This was also the time <coughs> when psychology formally started. Of course, Rohr says it started earlier, but I am always lagging behind Rohr. When he said to me that it started in 18th century, I said, it, no, it was early 20th, 18th. And now he says it is 16th century, and I say, finally, I accept it is 18th. So. I'm lagging behind, but it was a reasonable, re for some reason, <coughs> exactly between 1722, 1732 and 1734, you see this fellow, <coughs> Abraham de Moivre, the Huguenot, emi Huguenot emigre refugee to England, developing the notion, two issues of two volumes, of, uh, two presentations of doctrine of chances. No, thank you. So what was important in the 18th century, especially in upper classes of social kind? How to play dice, how to play cards, of course, worry about the life course, and of course, recording planetary movements. They were very important at the time to observe. These are all events that persons create in outer world, including actually the points of life course. That is, you predict the life course not of your own, but you try to predict the life course for very practical goal of life insurances. That is, how do you know that you can bet that this particular gentleman here would live until 80 and until 70 and so on? This is a, not my own worry, it's an outside. I need to make money out of the other people's life and death. They were not in inner world, they were not inside the person, they were outside of the person. They were all observational, uh, practical action tasks. How to play cards, how to uh, throw dice. So Abraham de Moivre exactly specified on November 12th, 1733. It was very explicit in the very last paragraph of his uh, otherwise purely mathematical issue about normal, uh, normal, prob uh, normal curve. Although the chance produces irregularities, still the odds will be infinitely great that the process of time, in the process of time, these irregularities will bear no proportion to the recurrency of that order which naturally results of the original design. So naturally results in original design. Time is mentioned, but time is only a particular parameter in which these events happen, and they accumulate over time. So following the Moira, Carl Friedrich Krauss, who is considered to be the 
name giver to the Gaussian curve, was not interested in distribution of human beings. He was interested in very explicitly about errors that astronomers make in trying to evaluate when the celestial objects go a particular place. Only later, after Catele in the 1800s, you would see the transition. And the transition is exactly very interesting. As long as it is seen as outside, my mistake in, as an astronomer evaluating when a planet reaches a particular place, or my mistake in playing cards, my mistakes in almost anything, it becomes to I as a mistake. I am a mistake because I deviate from the average norm. The norm is average, the ideal is the homogeneity of the population, and I am somewhat deviant from it, therefore I am a mistake. Not mistake out there, but mistake in me. This, of course, has enormous implications for social order. First of all, it requires homogenization of social order as a norm. This comes exactly in the 18th century together with the downfall of, first of all, different uh, aristocratic systems together with a capitalist system upgrowth. Yeah. Secondly, the tolerance of variation. The Gaussian curve actually sets up limits on tolerance on the mistakes uh, as I am compared to the average. I can be mistake towards the lower part or upper part. In the American very nice little uh, um, radio show by Garrison Keillor about a particular strange place, Lake Wobegon in Minnesota, he, where all children are above average. This is uh, another sense. Uh, Nice impossibility, which is desire. So, in the 21st century, I would claim, and this claim I made mildly in the text you saw, but now I make it less mildly, I think it is time to overcome the Gaussian distribution as a particular goal in itself and honor different other distributions which exist if we want to play it time-free or to get rid of it altogether and look at something else. This is basically an axiom that we have been living with 200 years, more or less, and the axiom that stifles the development of new ideas in, in social sciences at large. So what could be the al alternative? And this is very tentative now. Uh, assuming that any psychological phenomena we see in stable conditions are ready for movement. This actually follows Alexis and Tanya's lectures of some years ago, where the focus was very strongly on looking at movement. I will add to it here the specific notion that the movement is not only when it is already happening, but basically the phenomena as axiomatically assumed as ready for movement. The question becomes, when do they start to move? And so that is back to the conditionality. So the movement, we can argue, is towards non-linearity starting from the possibly superimposed linearity. What we have been doing in the social sciences is that we have been superimposing the linear model upon the curvilinear world. When you look into the nature, you see no linear, exactly linear shapes. When you look into architecture, you see many of them. So the distance between here and the bushes out there is exactly the distance between curvilinear world and linear world. The l even if we push a linear world on the curvilinear world by our methods, it escapes it anyway. How? Since our very first encounters in Clark with Brady, we, I have been obsessed and Brady has been active in terms of looking at the very simple methods that psychologists so often use, and nowadays everybody uses because it is electronically very easy, which is a rating scale. You can enter almost any place nowadays in public, and when you exit from it, you get nice little three of options. Smiling face, neutral face, and a negative face. Yeah? You are assumed to rate. Our world becomes that of rating. We are living in rated world. If you think that you are doing good for somebody by rating something, you are doing actually the act of enslavement into ratings because they come back to you. Now, the, the rating scale is very interesting in a number of reasons. First of all, it's widely used. But it has some very interesting features. 
of course, there is a target object, and there is a linear scale, whatever length, whatever format, which has one end and another end. One is positive, one is negative. They can also be not only positive, negative, but the idea is that they are linear. Now, the opposites assume that the one opposite is exclusive of the other. So what is good cannot be bad. What is bad cannot be good. That's the first assumption here. We need to know, understand very clearly, we understand very clearly that in most of our, for example, self-other relations, the two are not opposites. They are mutually related. I am different from you, but I am related with you and you are related with me. So we are not exactly op exclusive opposites. The second very interesting point, is which is so visible and so surprising that nobody has paid, paid attention to it, is the status of the ends. The status of the ends fixates your respondent's possible options of expressing your feelings about it. You can say this is good, or very good, to this is very bad, but you cannot express on that scale. It's not only very good, it's absolutely excellent, it's absolutely fascinating. You cannot express on the other side, it's not only very bad, it is disgusting, it is totally obnoxious, like my lecture here. So, so that's, yeah, so you, you, therefore, we are very happy to use these rating scales exactly because they avoid ratings. They avoid ref bringing out the specific relevant phenomena which actually we are operating with. And last but not least, it's a bogus example of quantification. Rating scale is not a quantitative method. Rating scale is a qualitative method. It's a graphic minimalized uh, projective object which requires completely on our capacity to perform rapid introspection. Without the capacity to perform rapid introspection, rating scales would be resisted and not used. Because it's perfect nonsense to ask somebody to give a rating of some target objects as quickly as possible on a particular scale. It's only possible if you accept that and then immediately start to evaluate in your emotion system yeah, and then put the marker on the scale which is unitary marker, rather than it could be, for example, an arrow. It can be something else, but it isn't. It's a unitary marker. Once you have done that, it is turned into quantification by artifact. So the rating scale as it is given is artificially turned into ratio scale and analyzed statistically as if these were hard data. They are not hard data your particular rating on a particular scale and your next neighbor's particular rating on the same scale are completely different subjective introspective results. But at the, at the stage of data analysis, they become interpreted as if they were the same. So you see very easily how a very popular method becomes basically artifact, psychological artifact or methodology. Now we published a paper with Brady in 2005 analyzing the actual process of rating making. There have been a number of other papers about rating scales, deconstructing rating scales, but it doesn't matter. What matters is a general principle here of how a method starts to limit rather than enhance particular access to phenomena. Rating scale eliminates the possibility of actually access to effective phenomena. So, what is happening instead? As I was saying, we are starting from linearity, for example, pain, pleasure. At certain moment, this linearity becomes curvilinear. Somehow the pain becomes suspiciously close to pleasure. I just love being in the, where well, I never go, of course, the, uh, the sp sports club to do this exercise. <laughs> yeah. I just love the sweat that I'm working on. To say. And the more I do it, the more proud I am of myself, although it's a totally obnoxious feeling of being sweaty. And finally, there is an interesting synthesis where the pleasure becomes pain and they are not separable. Remember again the intransitivity cycle. Well, here we come to the notion of 
where qualitative leap in this curve linearization gives us something that we call aesthetic. This is actually a solution that comes from the 18th century, but slightly elaborated in by me. So it may start from common language oppositions, pain, pleasure, but under some, some conditions, the so to say the opposition becomes united, but not yet overcome. Furthermore, under some conditions of distancing, crossing the border of disinterest, we arrive at aesthetic moments, which are characterized by what? They are characterized by a very interesting feeling of disinterested interest. I'm very interested in this particular object as art object, but I do not have any personal interest in him, in it. Yeah? I'm very interested in that object, so I'm very interested in art, but I do not use art in my everyday life. It is not linked with my body. Well, maybe. Here you see two paintings by the same artist, Fernando Botero. And here you see the well, issue of aesthetic of volumes together with the presentation of body and uh, flowers and the uh, face. If you pay careful attention, the volumes are similar. Fernando Botero explicitly says that he is not painting naked women of absu absurdly size, large size. He is painting volumes. He has spent years in Italian art museums learning how to depict volumes. That it happens to be a naked woman used here for the purpose, this is basically coincidental. He would have similar paintings about vases and flowers and so on. But this illustrates a contrast. Almost every presentation of Botero in public orientation emphasizes that he paints, uh, painted, paints very large women. Strange. Why very large? Yeah? But this is exactly moving down from the hierarchy of the moving to aesthetics, down to the under aesthetic. Well, let us test you more. How would you enjoy this one? This is surrealist art. Catalan painter, Angel Panels. Los Estranos Jugadores, 1930-42. In that year, in Europe, of course, almost everybody was strange player. Even in Spain and even exactly in Cadaqués, together where he was born similar to Salvador Dali. And here you are. You can be fascinated by this kind of art, by both in its immediate repercussions of horror and at the same time immediate repercussions of beauty. The unity of the two gives us a very interesting aesthetic feeling on the border of the aesthetic. So let it, going back from arts to basic sciences, let me ask you the question, or let me ask the question, what can cultural psychology, or maybe psychology in general, learn from astrophysics and development? Yesterday, the contrast was made between hard sciences, basic sciences, our science, and so on. And I want to point out there are no differences. There are differences only in the specific phenomena, where they are located, how easily they are accessible, but when it comes to issues of epistemological kind. Science is one. Basic science is physics. Basic science is cultural psychology. Basic science can be psychology if it abandons, rethinks certain assumptions. Yeah? What is GW170817? It is a wave. It is a gravitational wave that was recorded once on the 17th of August in 1917. Uh, 19, sorry, 2017. Oh, silly me. So, this is a wave. This is by one recording system. This is by other recording system. This is by third recording system. This is a collaboration, international collaboration of three teams of astrophysicists looking for gravitational waves. Einstein was talking about them. In the 1960s, the hypothesis of their existence was theoretically put forth 
but not empirically testable. It took until actually in 2015 that the empirical proof of their existence could be found. These are not waves that happen at every moment. They happen at very specific moments in the universe. You need to look very carefully and you need to know where to look. And in this case, they have decided that the look is at the intersection of neutron stars that are about to collapse into one. At that, exactly at the moment of the collapse, this kind of wave is, first of all, producible and could be detected, which it was. It tells us something quite interesting that we may learn from. What we call data are actually traces of the phenomena that by the time of recording are already extinct. Now, the case of gravitational waves is very simple. When we record it, or they recorded it in April, in August 2017, the event actually happened exactly 3,200,000 years ago. So the, the parallel, finding it simultaneously in the astronomical case is impossible. We find always something that takes some time to reach our recording instruments. But I want to point out that this is precisely the same if you record, a video record the behavior of a child at this moment and go back to this video recorded evidence next month or next hour. The actual event that was video recorded does not exist anymore. What exists is a recording of it. And all your analysis is based on the recording, not the original event. The original event can happen only once and will never be repeated again exactly as such. This is a very strong limitation on side of irreversibility of time, and exactly that leads us to the notion of the data are traces rather than data are exact, that is the representations of the phenomena. <coughs> the data as traces are always those of single instance, and this is my reason of 2015, emphasizing that generalization is possible only from single case and even from single instance. Uh, when I make that claim, and later on, quite recently, I was suggesting that, that we need, instead of big data, we need nanopsychology. We need a psychology where the data say, set is minimal, trace like this, together with theoretical orientation that is maximal to understand the minimal, tra minimal trace that we see here. The one single episode in psychotrauma, the one single episode of trivial action in everyday life is to be analyzable from psychological point of view in general and obviously from cultural psychological point in particular. So that's a major point that we can learn actually from astrophysics. What I have to add here is that astrophysics is deeply developmental. The celestial objects are not just existing, they are constantly in movement, they are constantly in transformation, neutron stars collapse into one another, and so on. Basically, nowadays, astronomy becomes actually developmental science without any notion of human development. So the ironical issue is that if you want to study human development, you don't go to non-developmental part of psychology department, you go to developmental biology, you go to astro astrophysics, if you want to study it. So it's a paradoxical because, obviously, the Neutron stars do not have none of any of the notions of self, non-self orientation, any of the notion of semiotic mediation, and so on and so forth. So that is how the jingle case generalization works. This is also an old scheme you have seen before, some of you at least. But the idea is that it, in order to be context inclusive uh, for evidence, you should study single cases, and I emphasize here as, as three single cases which are very carefully located in the societal matrix. So you don't study populations, you don't study samples. This is for the traditional psychology to do. You study concrete individual who is located in particular place in social institution in this particular society. You develop a particular systemic model of this relation which you test on another individual which is ideally not part of the same society. There is where the immigrants 
become important. Immigrants are relevant testing cases, or people who have immigrated years ago. Yeah? I would be a very good testing case of studying Americanism after 30 years in America, North America, I mean. Yeah? And then you develop the model further and go to the other end. So in other sense, you look for maximum variation, and you make absolutely certain that your model applies to the extremes of the variation, rather than the middle. The middle doesn't matter. You go to the next person similar to you, well, you replicate what you have, but it doesn't matter. What is relevant is testing it far from the equilibrium rather than equilibrium. Piaget had a very nice rule of thumb, and sometimes he said, well, you go to school, if three children in a row give you similar answers, you go to another place. You don't need to repeat because you don't need accumulation of the same. You need actual difference. So now we come from the notion of inductive and deductive to abductive inference. In number of the publications in the recent five years, abductive inference has been very much emphasized. But let us look at one specific aspect. This is a usual Pearson notion. Something happens which is surprising, and then we invent post factum a particular explanation. A, if it could be true, it would be natural. Then we therefore backward assume that A is true. However, this is what I would claim. Not every explanation from the past is actually allowed by different social and, I would say, moral forces to enter into the realm of possible A's, or possible explanations in the abductive scheme. Some of them are possible but not allowed in the past. So future is not allowed. That's almost the only example where it is allowed somewhat is a dynamic system theory attractor, but this is also not assumed causal. They would avoid to say it's causal. It's just pulling, pulling, not causal. Yeah. Cause, cause is coming from the past, so to say. But not every cause is allowable. But you see the fight against specific notions that uh, deities are not allowable in science, probably for good reason at certain time. You say that s uh, unconscious is not allowable in real psychology, although it is still sitting there, and so on and so forth. So there is very clear social regulation of what hypothesis you can actually entertain in backward from the surprising event. So in this sense, uh, abduction is constrained. It's socially constrained. It may be politically constrained. Back in Soviet Union, 1960s, nobody could ever study gender differences because by the Soviet system, gender differences did not exist. Why do you need to study them? In other sense, if somebody found a gender difference, to attribute it backwards to gender difference would have been basically impossible because you are, it's not science, you are just a dissident. Mm. So this leads us to the research as a communicative process, which itself is constantly socially negotiated. They're negotiating, and this is basically we're now entering the realm of those few of you who will be in the doctoral course in the next few days. This is constant negotiation is nicely demonstrable in Carl Bühler's organ model elaborated. When we build up our different methods for research questions, we assume that what we ask our subjects to do, or participants to do, is accepted the same way as we give this. <coughs> According to Bühler's model, this is a special case, a rare case, but almost impossible case. The researcher may suggest a particular message which is actually interpreted in different ways. And more than that, the participant looking at the researcher asking this question actually asks a counter-question. Counter-question can come in different ways. A young woman goes to an African village as an anthropologist wanting to study Women's child-rearing issues, the counter-question is, how many children do you have? Another question, are you married? If you're not married, we'll marry you here. So you need to be married. Yeah? 
So in other sense, the counter question is always there, even if it's not expressed. Why is this question being asked of me? Even the, somebody asks you a simple question, what is your ethnic background? And your answer is, I am not East European. A very concrete example of an Estonian young woman living for some time in the United Kingdom. So to say, uh, in other sense, uh, don't tell, talk me about me as East European before I tell you that I'm Estonian. So here is an interesting discrepancy. Hundred years ago, Bronislaw Malinowski will be discussing something with his informants in Papua New Guinea. Notice the interesting external difference in dressing. I want to point out that the external difference need not be internal difference. I think all of these people are closed in equivalent ways, but only their particular way of contrast in the question answering process would be, could be different. One of my German colleagues is emphasizing the need for the researcher to be dressed similarly to the people they study. So it turns out that when he prepares German students to go to Papua New Guinea, they have to go through nudity training first. <laughs> but when he prepares the same students to go to internship in Un United Nations, then they have to be, t t be prepared to wear suits. So, so, so you see the different different aspects of sensitivity to the contrast in closing here. Max Wertheimer, who is of course known first of all by his work in visual perception and as well as in problem solving, in the late of his years was giving seminars in New School of Social Research in New York City. And this is one from one of his seminars. He pointed out exactly what I was saying before, I just bring it as a historical continuity, that the question asked is not the question answered, or need not be a question answered. It need not be that the opposite question is answered, a different question may be answered. So it can also be that the person accepts the question and continues along the lines, but it can also be oblique. So, so in other sense, uh, the idea of using the res resistance notions in question-answer sequences is not exactly very new. So now we come to the concrete part of that very directly links to what I'm trying to try to do in the talk. I'm trying to emphasize forward-oriented methodologies. The focus of forward orientation is exactly that of maintaining the constructivity of the future. So what does it mean? It is uh, methodological creativity is focused on ongoing construction process rather than particular past. The notion of independent and dependent variables, which we stumbled upon with Sven at the particular moment, is very importantly left aside. It's irrelevant. There are no independent and dependent variables. There are different conditions. And different conditions for particular work of imagination that leads us to the future. So the center of imagination comes now into the center of method construction. This is another well, not very young scheme. This is an example of how movement is entered into method construction. The idea is exactly that either by selecting particular everyday life situations where movement happens, or by creating the movement, by giving a moving inst movement instruction, you get <coughs> your particular participant to move from A towards the goal state B. But you know very well that either on that road there will be a disturbing obstacle. I call it meaning block. It can be a sign no entrance. It can be a symbolic object. I would very much like to do an experiment when you are all sitting here and somebody outside of that, that room lies down layer of books, two meters by two meters, and then we will have a coffee break. And the interesting question is how would you deal with books on the floor? Will you walk over them? Your 
put tramping on books. If it was youth papers, you would probably have no difficulty, but, or, but books may be different. Will you start to remove the obstacle? This is a question, basically. This can happen in everyday life. Books? Huh? Are those good books? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. That adds a nice little condition, which means you will spend the first five minutes looking at the books <laughs> and then deciding whether you tramp on them or whether you... Collective uh, words by Lenin, 36 volumes. What would you do? I think I would tramp on <laughs> Maybe happily. <laughs> which is another important point, that it's also possible to tramp on certain books <laughs> very happily. It's also possible to throw some books into fire, which have been done in different symbolic moments. It's also it is also possible to recycle books. Although my, be my guess is that you each of you having books in your library, you will find hard time taking one of them that you don't like and putting it in the waste paper basket. I cannot. I I, um, when you get older, you might. I do. I know, I know. It, it's not. A, it's a serious problem, but uh, it needs a solution. But anyway, anyway, what happens exactly at this point is exactly here starts the experimental moment or the study moment. Not here. The beef happens here is relevant only as movement. This is Alex's and, and Athena's point from before. It is here where the microgenetic process starts. What can it do? Somebody can go back, say, I can't do it. Somebody can exit from the situation and never come to you again. And somebody will find a way out. And it's exactly that process that gives you the phenomena that you want to study. It may be a very short process. It may be a very dramatic process. But it is exactly there where the data would become relevant for you. This is a synthesis of Tanya's loop model and my own notion of forward-oriented semiosis. It emphasizes uh, two versions of imagination operating at the time of rupture. <coughs> Retroactive imagination, which otherwise you would call memory, but I don't call it memory. And pre-constructive through uh, proactive imagination. In the intersection of those two, uh, this is my hypergeneralized sign that is sent to the future. But the most important thing here is that it allows you to go on. So to say, this is a models united. What does it mean? How does it operate? If we try to look at the microstructure, what happens on that border, and this is very new scheme, which I'm actually not happy with, you would see the proactive and retroactive imagination in specific relationship in the present. The relationship, however, is built on a very curious phenomenon. This is supposed to be a spiral, and it kind of is. Yeah? Two spirals, backward-oriented, forward-oriented, or internally oriented. And the specific input from past or future leads to the particular reorganization point whether the spiral becomes working inwards or outwards. Inwards or outwards. If it works inwards, no further consultation of the future is expected. No more imagination. Yeah? If it works outwards, constant looking for the future. If it works inwards, no memory. I don't want to hear anything about the past. If it's just the opposite, I want to know everything from the past. So why is that? What is the reason of using spirals rather than something else? Spirals are everywhere the abundance of spiral forms in all of our lives. The right wing is obviously Ionian column, top, Voluta up there. The left image is Theodor Lipsis, image, image on spirals in his aesthetic book. The spiral is a unity of the linear and nonlinear, but it's a limited unity. The spiral necessarily ends here. So the uh, end points are here. And here. You can imagine these endpoints to go inside, yeah? the third dimension. In other sense, this is a linear and nonlinear infinities linked together. So that's why spiral may be a bit more adequate way of looking at that phenomenon. 
In addition to that, I introduced in this paper actually something I call uh, sign field, structure of a closed and open sign field. In order to elaborate that, I would want to emphasize something that is maybe relevant for your methods, visual methods discussion in the next few days, which is context facilitated microgenesis. The focus here is exactly on the observation of formation of the Gestalt over time, but how? Where? This is a Gestalt formation over time. If you look at the development of new forms, there are intermediate forms that come in the process. This is actually also the place where you see imagination functioning to the maximum. Most of them will disappear. Only some of them will lead to the outcome. Most of our psychology without imagination focus has usually categorized what happens as either this or that, not paying attention to these forms. But in order to get from here to here, these forms come into being. They may be extremely rapid, and they are. So you may not be able to study them without explicitly turning the process slower, if you can. This is, a, I would call, constructive confabulation. You may say this is constructive confabulation does nothing than turn the notion of memory inside out. It's the same question of is it is the glass empty or full? It's half empty and half full. But in other sense, Bartlett's schemes of the past will tell us something about decay of memorizing, but they also tell us something about confabulation in addition to remembering. What I would want to emphasize is exactly the relevance of Bartlett's method and Brady's methods in the form of invention of new confabulated experiences. The original, I went out with my boyfriend yesterday for a dinner. Uh, the boyfriend pays the bill. We, we, each of us went back home. Next retelling. I went with my boyfriend to the dinner. We had a dinner. The damn boyfriend didn't let ask me even if I want to pay as equal person. And we went back home. Yeah? We went out for dinner. We had a dinner. I was totally upset that this damn boyfriend didn't even offer me to pay. And I will never meet him again. <laughs> this is an example of effect of re constructive re uh, confabulation, retelling the same episode over time. Yeah? Every next time, there is something added to it. And my point here is that something added may be affected. The affective point is quite important. So in other sense, this aff con const constructive confabulation completes a gestalt beyond the gestalt. It's no longer re recalling, remembering what was there, what was a gestalt. Actually, it will develop a new gestalt on the basis of the previous one. So. This is very obvious also in ornamentation. The right-hand side or left-hand side is a simple, simple scheme. The right-hand side turning it to ornament. This is my favorite topic of today. Ornaments have all kinds of specific framing roles. I will run over it. But now we come to the notion of the intermediate gestalt as affective moments, poetic moments in the middle. So this is what you again could be able to Notice in your method construction, you have a particular emerging narrative of some kind, which mostly is mundane, ordinary talk, whatever happens, A, B, C, D, and suddenly you will see an effective episode. Suddenly there is an effective outburst, which then goes back into ordinary. One of my American young female students remembers forever when she went to all girls school, a nun came into class, and in the middle of the particular lesson said loudly, you should not masturbate. And she remembers that forever. And then everything goes back to mathematics or whatever. So it's a it's kind of emotional assertion that suddenly coming out of seemingly nowhere is something that we may want to pay attention. This is you saw already. 
And this you haven't seen yet. This is comes from Tanya and uh, Tatsuya's work. The specific um, object on the wall of a displaced person after Fukushima catastrophe, which is important in interesting ways. Had the researchers not queried about it, it could look as a glory story for the cleanup crew of the Fukushima. It is nothing of the kind. The reason it is there is that in the background of it, in the little mountain, is a cemetery from which all of the people in the place they are now living have been displaced because of the issue. The most whole issue was that of regaining the cemetery, not about the crew. This you have seen yesterday, and I think I will not dwell upon it all, but basically you can start to see how the triple Gegenstand system may be workable. This actually comes from our reanalysis within Sina of, of the June case, from the already published version. But what I want to work you through today, in the remaining time, is what I consider one of the perhaps the best experimentum cruises or interview, crucial interviews that I have seen in the history of looking at moral reasoning and so on. This is a notion of Pabaji interview from uh, Richard Schroeder and Nancy Much, 1987, with a Kohlberg's dilemma displaced into India. And since this is a particular publication where you will be able to see the whole interview, I strongly recommend if you're interested to look at the original because my r rendering is only limited here. Yeah. Uh, also the important issue is that Schroeder sent the results of that interview to then still alive Kohlberg who confessed that he could not code this particular interview in his system of coding. In this sense it's also experimentum cruises. This is a so-called Ashok dilemma, Indian version of Heinz dilemma. A woman suffered from a fatal disease. To cure her, doctors prescribed a medicine. That particular medicine was only available in one medicine shop. The pharmacist demanded 10 times the real cost. The sick woman's husband, Ashok, could not afford it. He went to everyone he knew to borrow money, but he was able to borrow only half of the sum. He asked the pharmacist to give him the medicine at half price or to give it to him for credit. But the pharmacist said, no, I will sell it any price I like. There are many persons who will purchase it. After trying so many legal ways to get the medicine, her husband considered breaking into the shop and stealing the medicine. So the Heinz dilemma is turned into Ashok dilemma. And here starts the story. Should Ashok steal the drug? No. He's feeling desperate because his wife is going to die, and that is why he's stealing the drug, but people don't live forever and providing her the drug does not necessarily mean she will live long. So to say how long you live is not in our hands but in God's hands. Okay. Uh, the Schroeder insists on the premise, that is, Asher, uh, Babaji is not accepting the premise. The Babaji is a, in his mid-30s uh, car mechanic driver who was uh, Schroeder's driver in India, religiously educated in Hindu sense, Schroeder insists he has no other way out. She has, in, she has no money and uh, stealing is bad. He has made a mistake, is the answer. But his wife is going to die. There is no way in Hindu Dharma that, the man, that to steal even if one is go, man is going to die. Okay, on we go. The story continues on and on because the argument is simply rejected over and over again. Uh, Schroeder tries multiple ways, tries to explain that, well, he, his wife will die, but that is, again, the God comes in with answer. But the, old, the particular medicine only way out, but there's no reason to think so. So you see the kind of constant discussion, which is strictly keeping the positions of both of the participants. So... He can marry other women is an answer if the family will break up. And then, of course, this is story, the counter-arguments. Babaji goes in counter-offensive, so to say. And so it goes on and on. If he loves his wife, doesn't matter. But finally, finally, the most important point that you will see is exactly the new move. The back and forth arguing reaches a twist. 
Our sacred scriptures tell us sometimes stealing is an act of dharma, so sometimes it's possible. If by stealing you uh, I can save your life, then it is an act of dharma. But one cannot steal for his wife or his offspring or, or, or for himself. If he does that, it is simply stealing. So the issue here is not about stealing or not stealing. The issue is stealing under what conditions. And the conditions are set up about who is who. And the who is who is myself and my family. No stealing. But for outsiders, yes. So borders can be the set at different parts of the system. So most of our applicability of different notions is depends on the borders. So here is the little model I showed before briefly of that. So what we have here is a notion of very clear regulation. Stealing is sin. You can instead sell yourself. See, Babaji offered three times that Yasuo could sell himself or borrow. And at the same time, the Dharma leads to some extension. So Shredder fails to extend the Dharma. Babaji does it himself. If it were somebody else, stealing is possible, but not for your family. This leads us to interesting issues of sign medi mediated aspects, which is the same model elaborated a little. People like to help others. And this feeling of wanting to help anybody would, in my terminology, be hypergeneralized feeling that is somewhere in the core of the self. So just people go around constantly looking for how, how to whom to help. But of course, there are different people. Some of them want to be helped, such as avoiding, some are neutral. So. But there is all this kind of orientation, can I help you? Once the help becomes accepted, there could be direct instructions, direct uh, uh, prohibitions and so on. So the helping is the only a ground for specific power plays that will happen. Now, to cut a very long story short, and I have today taken more time than yesterday, I want to have some questions and discussion. So, so only three uh, final points. I got tired by the end. <laughs> so, first of all, Methodology cycle sets up conditions for method construction. In other sense, this is something for your doctoral course to consider seriously. If you want to construct methods, you have to locate the methodology cycle. If you don't locate, you end up with a, a method for something, but maybe for nothing. Research is an act of communication where abduction is central, but as you saw, abduction is constrained. And finally, and this is a point I started from in a way, cultural psychology can survive if it develops its own ways of creating phenomena adequate methods. This is my concern from the beginning, that is, we talk and talk about cultural psychology, sometimes making it plural, cultural psychologies, sometimes claiming that we are exclusive, we are very special because we study very complex phenomena, we only find out that astrophysicists study even more complex phenomena, even more far away. For well, the brain scientists actually have very big limits of how to get access to the actual dynamics of the brain, more than we. So in this way, it's not about uh, what, what we do, but how we do it better. And thank you for your attention. So I think we have plenty of interesting material to comment on before lunch. Yeah. Oh. Uh. <clears throat> so yeah, thank you very much for uh, for for uh, the presentation that goes beyond the, the paper, uh, introducing a lot of interesting uh, ideas. Uh, I have maybe, maybe it's a, it's a stupid question or comment, but I was really impressed when you mentioned this idea of considering. Uh, 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 open system the, the, from the perspective of not uh, uh, assuming axiomatically that the system is going to change. So the question does not become when, but do, does become uh, to observe how it changes. Yeah. Um, and it immediately I made this strange maybe association. I was thinking, who? what are the other sciences that deal with a similar kind of phenomena. Uh, 
And immediately it came to me that there are at least three physical sciences that mm -hmm. do this. And there are meteorology, volcanology, and mm -hmm. geophysics. Mm -hmm. So w they know for sure that these kind of changes will happen, that mm -hmm. will be a volcano mm -hmm. eruption. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they, as far as I understand, uh, as far as I understand, they had uh, they have very interesting features. The first one is that they work with open systems made of open systems. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. each volcano is an open system which is part of the larger open systems. Mm -hmm. um, the second is that their, their goal is no longer to predict exactly when mm -hmm. uh, the, the eruption will take place, because again, this is, we know that, we mm -hmm. assume that it's going to happen, uh, but the goal is now is to learn to read the conditions and the progressive emerging of the conditions for the mm -hmm. eruption mm -hmm. in order, in practically, to, uh, to, to just to give notice mm -hmm. to the population, for instance. So it's re reading to learn the emergence of, mm -hmm. uh, of the process. And the third, I think, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very interesting point is um, is somehow that they are observing in the case of the weather of volcano or geophysics they and this is my question they are they are observing systems that are in permanent state of dynamic tension mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when there is no more tension there is no more volcano because it's mm -hmm. kind of extinct mm -hmm. so there will be no event of change mm -hmm. uh, again so how would you locate, for instance, the, this concept of tensions, uh, of inner tension there? Well, that from the last point you made about um, when the, there is no more tension, there is no more volcano. And I would say that there will be no, if, if there will be no tension in the psychological systems, then there will be no psychological system. Self, for example, self-other, talking of self-other of yesterday, it exactly leads to the notion that there has to be the self-other and the tension between it. The tension is maintaining the particular way of being, the particular steady state. So now, on top of that tension, come different tension regulators. I can regulate my own tension in my self-other dialogue. I can get angry of the person for no good reason. The person is completely surprised that I'm angry at the person, but I'm angry at that person because it's important for me. So some people go around being angry at everybody. Psychologists go around being angry at mainstream, for example. Yeah? It's the same story. That is, why should I endlessly tell the story that the mainstream is completely horrible, wrong, and so on? Why simply say I don't care about it? Yeah? I just eliminate it. I, I find other tensions. But no, I can go around. Mainstream is wrong. I tell you mainstream is wrong. The same with dualism. We are fighting with dualism all the time. I have to tell you, dualism is very bad. You are a dualist. Uh, so you are very bad. And they say, yes, of course, well, I'm a dualist. So what? Uh, so what's the big problem? The problem is for the one who needs to talk about dualism, not for the dualism themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are specific ways of regulating, maintaining tension, so to say. There are also ways of overcoming tension. In other sense, uh, in contrast to volcanoes, which do not themselves goal-orientedly regulates attention, in which case they could nicely decide when to erupt on a national holiday, for example. <laughs> uh, instead of that, they just erupt. But in human cases, they can nicely regulate when they would erupt. The human person is a volcano with preset possibilities of, ten of tension eruptions, <laughs> if we want to turn human beings into volcanoes. Okay, well. <coughs> well, first of all, I have to thank you because I think you made a, a brilliant presentation of, of how to face methodology and how to, to proceed ahead in developing a methodology for uh, cultural psychology. But when you see it, found but at the beginning, at the end, and at the end of your presentation, there uh, there are a couple of things uh, that you that you mentioned, which I think they are 
a key key element yeah. in for that, which is actually the last three words in in uh -huh, there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. How would, would you judge or anybody would judge that a method is adequate for the phenomenon? Because before you dismiss at the beginning the idea of objectivity. And the um, idea of truth didn't appear either, nor the idea of reliability of observations. Uh, okay, and I, I did think not, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And I think that somehow a sort of criteria of what made a method adequate for the phenomenon is needed. Because the phenomenon itself, uh -huh. I think it would be created uh -huh. in a communicative uh -huh. act. Yeah as also mm -hmm. is the method mm -hmm. and the explanation. Mm -hmm. And mm, I think that would fall also in what yep. uh, Fatali mm -hmm. Mogadam yesterday said of it's, it's a normative, it's normative. Yeah, good point. And, and that's, uh, that's something that I think that has to be also theoretically elaborated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to have uh, a sort of, of consensus within a community about what a phenomenon is like mm -hmm. and what the, the type of explanation, whether descriptive, uh, chaotic, or catastrophic, or open system, or whatever, mm -hmm. is offered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good points. First, to correct myself, if it was not clear, I did not dismiss objectivity. I only specified that objectivity is a sign, sign field. It's a meta-level sign field that regulates our organization of epistemological acts. It is not an obje objectivity is not objective in it by itself. That's my point. But more importantly, what you bring in needs me to go actually back rather long way. Okay, here we are. You raise the question: what is phenomena adequate? The question is phrased in terms of here, right? What kind of methods are phenomena adequate? Yes. The whole point of creating this methodology cycle is to emphasize that none of the direct linkages alone are sufficient for elaborating. For example, you could also not find what, are constru what constructed methods are theory because if they are only built on theory, they will mismatch with the phenomena. I think the rating scale brought it home quite clearly. The rating scale is a perfectly constructed method here, based on specific theoretical assumptions that I tried to, the limits of which I tried to outline, but it is perfectly blind to phenomena. In other sense, to answer your question, the adequacy of phenomena and methods is actually determined here, all through that part. If the phenomena are uh, selected in such a way that the meta-level, meta-code issue is set up in particular ways, you will get one solution versus another in the whether they are adequate to the method, so to say. So, uh, yeah. So the answer to your question is the movement by the researchers' effort across the whole range of the, of, the, of the methodology cycle, not at any other, not at two consecutive parts. Exactly the same would apply to basic assumptions and theory construction. Mm -hmm. and that, that would mean then that it has a, a sort of positioning, shared positioning of the researchers towards that phenomenon has to be settled. Yes, exactly. Norm, uh, exactly. A sort of social norm. Well, uh, yes, uh, social norms that we make explicit, uh, like we would do. That is uh, the Adorno, Frankel, Brunswick, and others in 1950 were looking at fascist personality, exactly similar way as a German psychologist in 1930s were looking at the same phenomena from the point of view of, so to say, uh, uh, adequate way of character. That would, would, then would take 
due to constructive theory and a sort of yeah, orthodoxy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And a sort of orthodoxy yeah. to be able to catch the phenomenon. Yeah. Thank you, Jan, for two uh, wonderful talks um, that nicely complement each other. Uh, my question is about how to move from dynamic, uh, open systems and to agency. Uh, uh, you began to talk about this uh, in mm -hmm. response to Lucas' question, the difference between volcanoes, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and we have to understand those in terms of open systems, uh, dynamic theories and all this and persons. And y yesterday, I believe, uh, Nikita raised the question, so what is the ontology of the person? And mm -hmm. I guess my question is a, a follow-up to those questions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is a great leap forward from mechanistic notions to dynamic ones, from uh, uh, causal uh, mm -hmm. approaches to open system ones. Mm -hmm. But it's seems to me that we still need to go further to arrive at normativity, at agency, at persons who act in, in social worlds. So how, how to do that? <laughs> Very good point. I have no answer. We have to write another paper. <laughs> but Bob has an answer. Yeah, and at the, uh, the last part on constructive confabulation and uh, methods that would be adequate to the phenomena that uh, I think are deeply important right now. And it deals with the, the narrative of the Holocaust, the, 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 the case right now of Poland, uh, which has great consequences for retelling the story of the Holocaust, which mirrors, of course, the great battle of the German historians uh, about the, uh, the, the telling the story of the Holocaust and whose story is it. and. Uh, what are the consequences of, of a particular type of choices? It seems to me this is a, a perfect research project for multiple groups because uh, Poland is by no means homogeneous uh, and uh, in a certain sense is, is telling a narrative of victimization while uh, the German uh, narrative of victimization was a very different type of victimization. They were victimized by somebody from, from the inside. Well, with Poland, we have now the story of victimization from the outside, but it's connected with an, another whole story of, of, of anti-Semitism and of, of racial disparities and all of this. So it seems to me uh, a t real test case would be what could cultural psychology itself offer uh, in terms of, of, of the agency both of cities or, and of and of groups and of regions uh, that would bring in some of the things that uh, that Sven brought in here about the movement now to responsibility and all of those other, um, all those other hyper-generalized notions that we are, that we are concerned with. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That would be very central, a very, very potent, and potentially explosive <laughs> research topic. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Jan. As well, I, I was going to. Um, different, I mean, mm -hmm. less serious point, I think. But I was trying to think about the connection between the, um, the phenomena you were highlighting yesterday, the liminality and mm -hmm. the borders and, and the resistance and what you show today, and also how you try to uh, bring the method to look at precisely those moments mm -hmm. that correspond to the liminality you were describing mm -hmm. yesterday, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I have one question about um, those schemes you bring about the two little mm -hmm. spirals meeting in the imagination, uh, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. And um, I didn't understand really how you uh, explain, I mean, the jump you make between the retroactive imagination and proactive imagination and the need to speak in terms of spirals because spirals are general. Mm -hmm. can, can you explain something somewhere, that jump? Yeah, this I, I made a jump. And this is a jump, actually, to my other work on ornaments. So that explains uh, uh, the jump being somewhat unexpected. Because suddenly I decided to bring it in. <laughs> but let me try. This is a scheme you are yeah. talking about. So why the spirals? And actually, let me come from the other sp start from here. Ever since you see the classic columns being 
archite architecturally created, you would start seeing spiral forms right here. Yeah. And Theodore Lips was in looking in his aesthetics and, archi and architectural psychology, paid also attention to the spiral forms. So I come to them from there. Now, after looking at them, I realized something which is usually not being done. And that something is a question how you look at the spiral. If you look at the generic presentations of spiral, they start to go from spiral I outwards. They essentially go from curvilinear to linear. But you can exactly reverse the order. You can reverse the order of the movement towards the spiral's eye. What is the difference? Imagine that our world is completely ornamented with spiral forms, and, and very often it is. No, not completely, but very often it comes close to it. What does it mean to grow up and live in a society which is constantly surrounding you with visual forms that are of spiral kind? The unity of the closeness and openness in a spiral allows you the unity of the two opposites. They are embedded in the same form. And they are constantly reminding you when they are embedded in an ornament. They are not causal. They are supportive of your particular feeling about something. The interesting aspect from that point of view is to analyze patterns, for example, on wedding dresses and other costumes and so on, looking for spiral forms exactly there. So to say, why would they be there? What, why would anybody long before any psychologist entered into the scheme start to use spiral forms in decorations? So that uh, there is some function in the spiral forms. Now, this is a, so far I'm talking about the forms as everyday life phenomenon. Now I shift to the notion of spiral forms as a potential theoretical tool. And this is what this is about. Spiral forms as a potential theoretical tool allows us a dynamic unification of opposites. The, in this particular poorly drawn figure, you would see that the particular imagination from outside or inside leads to potential reversal of the focus of orientation, and let us call it this way. A person can become forward-oriented, inside or inside-oriented, dependent on that one little switch that happens. What would be real-life phenomena of that, coming back to real life? People who are not exactly living in the middle of horrors may go to horror films. People who live in everyday horrors will not go to horror films. In other sense, if you need to see a dead corpse, you go to horror films. You have never seen it. But if the dead corpses are everywhere in the field next to your house, you probably do not rush to a cinema to see another one. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one example, a rather crude one. So for me, the effort to build on spiral forms, actually in the Ornamented Lives book, I'm making a very strong claim that the spiral forms are actually unity of two infinities, the linear and curvilinear. And, and I would say that there is kind of a, in, yeah, I would say, I don't remember what I would say. But, that it, but in that sense, that's a theoretical tool to think about the dynamics. There is no hypothesis that being surrounded by spirals is sort of internalized and organized our way of thinking. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's an effort to organize our, effort to organize our theoretical scheme so that we can see the unity of the opposites in the one scheme. That's it, basically. Sorry, but isn't it a similar concept or the same concept where which Hegel used when he speaks about development, mm -hmm. about a, a circle returning with, within itself. Yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, builds, it builds heavily on, on all of the dialectical philosophy from Fichte, or more Fichte than Hegel, actually, in my case. So I'm literally trying to find uh, graphic and general forms that would put dialectics back into the thriving seat of uh, social sciences. Mm. They have been basically either eliminated or turned into travesties in political sense, but they have not been developed. So it's very interesting even 
We know an interesting dispute with Niels Engelstad in the published his, his book. I found in his book, which was published recently, a beautiful demonstration of the dialectical double negation, and he adamantly re refused that he has ever done that. <laughs> so, in other sense, there is an interesting tension about where you find the dialectical scheme in authors who are actually doing it. So that's, but this is a side story. Yeah. But it seems that you, here you are implying a, a step forward. So it's not just the graphical representation of a, a dialectic, dialectical thinking system, but you are also implying the opposite. So the forms of yes. representation that we use yes, are somehow oriented as towards a specific form of dialectical, monological, or rather another kind of thing. That's true, yeah. Okay. Uh, Alex. I, thank you very much. I actually have a question slightly different, mm -hmm. going back to some of the earlier issues. I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about a concept we haven't mentioned, but I think is interesting, and it appeared today as the goal. Uh, you have in a couple of models, you have this goal, a future state, which mm -hmm. an, uh, someone, an organism, is tending mm -hmm. towards. And I think it's an interesting concept which we could discuss a bit more because it's something which we share with a lot of other disciplines. Most mm -hmm. of psychology, would, would from evolutionary to mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, environmental psychology to economic psychology, would have a, a, a sort of view that at the heart of being human is some sort of goal-directed activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it may be a point of common ground. I think it's also interesting to look at because it's something which cultural psychology is really good at because the future only exists as a symbolic form. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, most of the psychological work on goal-directed behavior is, as you say, trying to approach it from the past, but you actually have to approach it as a symbolic construction of the future and see how people are guiding themselves. But there's, there's almost no real research on how people build images of the future and how that regulates their behavior. So I also think it's a, a phenomenon we can really contribute to. I think it's also interesting uh, as a, a, a possible way into the agency question. I mean. That, that, that gives some angle on agency. And I think it can also feed into discussions about what is phenomena appropriate for us, because in a sense it yeah. achieves our goal and things work. I mean, obviously there's a whole history there of, um, go, it can get very crass and functionalist and so on, but equally it seems to be, as you were presenting the models today, part of the model. And, and maybe an interesting part. So I, I would just like to hear your views on that. I mean, obviously goals can get very complicated. You can have aesthetic mm -hmm. goals and all sorts of things. We, we, we can have an enriched view of it. But I would like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, my first intuition would go in the direction of trying to find the absolutely minimal model of this particular issue. And the minimal model is exactly the movement from here and now situation to the next moment which is unknown. So in other sense, one of the aspects of my semiotic mediation notion is exactly that the, the all of the sign making is basically pre-adaptation to the unknown next moment. Now here you can obviously bring in the agency more concretely because the one who makes them sign is a sign maker. That's a, again, William Stern had nice notion that there is no gestalt without gestalt maker. That's a personological basis. So here too, there is no sign without the sign maker, and the sign maker pre-adapts to the next expected moments in the what will happen or might not happen. So by narrowing it down to the immediate present to future link rather than long-term link would allow us to look at the agency right there, I think, and find a me create methods that would actually look at the agency. Well, let me make a very concrete, very simple, more maybe irrelevant detour. If you go back to the rating scale, which I have used as a demonstration, then in, in that rating scale, you can already build into this method a notion of agency by after asking the person to give a particular marker on the scale, you ask the same person, how far right or left could your marker go? Indicate by an arrow. In other sense, instead of asking for an answer, this is the answer, the marker. Asking for specific action, the marker could be this way or that way. And this is basically, if the person says, no, it's this, if it's there, it is there, versus, oh, it can go to the opposite, to the east direction, 
then we are see actually coming to the uh, roots of agents in very simple-minded form. But I'm just making it simple because it's very easy to make it complex. So that's the, uh, but I fully agree about the general need of it. And, and, uh, but still, I don't have an answer to any, uh, Sven's question. The uh, last question before one should be a provocation. If psychology as a discipline, as pointed out yesterday, is being pulled apart and essentially is becoming kind of like a cadaver, you know, neuroscience have to take the brain away and so on, why call it psychology if we axiomatically reject all of the basic premises on which modern mainstream psychology is built on? If we reject the normal curve, if we reject the static conception of a structured individual, if we reject the static boundary between person and environment, and indeed all of those other things, why don't call it something different? Well, the science of the new science of the psyche, psyche logic. Well, that's the solution then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, with that, let's go get some lunch. <laughs>